Today we're starting a brand new series that I'm calling Marriage 101. Marriage is so foundational and it's important to really get this down. I'm all about building strong homes and strong families and doing whatever we can to make sure that the foundation's in place so that we can be in a place where our family feels secure and it can flourish. And then we can go out and help the community. But if we don't get this right at home, and if we're struggling here, then a lot of times we don't have what we need to go out and do the work in the church and the community. So let's start a discussion about today, expectations. This is where I think a lot of us go really awry with our marriages. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So a lot of times, I think maybe women especially, I think we get the princess, the fairy tale whole idea in our head. And we are so fixated on getting married and that should lead to our happily ever after. And that's setting us up for a whole lot of disappointment. There's some things that we should expect from marriage, but there are other things that we absolutely should not expect from marriage. So let's start about things that we should expect from marriage. We should expect our spouse to be our lover. So that's something that he is the only one that can be that in our life. So that is absolutely a role that our only our husband should fill. We shouldn't be looking for sexual pleasure or any sort of sexual validation outside of our marriage at all. Once we're married, that's it. And in fact, if we're not married, we should be waiting for that. So sexual pleasure, our sexual fulfillment, that is an expectation that should be met in marriage. And we shouldn't go to other resources, shouldn't be tapping into pornography, shouldn't be seeking other relationships on the side to try to get it. And that is an okay expectation to have from our spouse. We should also expect our spouse to be an equal partner in serving God and seeking God. I can't imagine trying to be married to a man who didn't love Jesus. That just would not work for my life. We, when we got married, Steve and I, uh, one of our expectations is that we would always be part of a church. Sunday morning wasn't going to be a, well, if we feel like it, we'll get up and go to church. The expectation for both of us was that Sunday we would be somewhere worshiping God with our family of believers. And it wasn't just going to be Sunday. And when we were young and when we first got married, we didn't really express it beyond Sunday, but we knew we, we were both members of the same church when we got married. And that was something we actually talked about before we said, I do that we were going to have a church family and be active in church. We would definitely not have that be a maybe or leave it up to chance. We talked about it. The expectation was there. Even if we were out late on a Saturday night, which sometimes happened, we got married when I was young. Um, I was 22 when I got married. And so sometimes on Saturday night, we were out late with our friends. And still on Sunday morning, we were at church. And that is a good expectation to have from your spouse, that you should be able to grow in your relationship to the Lord with the Lord together. That's a good thing. Another good expectation from your spouse is to raise children together. When you're married, it's not a, 
you know, this is all your responsibility or this is all his responsibility. The world loves to say, oh, moms need to do this and dads need to do this, or it has to be 50-50 or whatever. But I, I don't know that that's realistic in terms of what really goes on. There are times in your life and in the life of your children, I always said until the kids were two, they were mine. And after they were two, it was almost like when they hit two, they automatically shut off from me because they didn't need me like they did when they were infants and toddlers. And they saw how fun their dad was. And all of a sudden, you know, they shifted from being the mama's girl or the mama's boy to really loving dad and wanting to read a book with dad and snuggle with dad and do all those things. And that's not to say that Steve wasn't involved with them as they were infants, but as they were infants, I did more of the caretaking and, and, you know, making sure they lived through the night than Steve did. And that was just the way it broke down. I also found that I was in a lot of ways better at the, um, school age things. Steve was way better doing math homework with the kids, but, you know, memory work and getting the kids to all the events and practices. That was pretty much me, whereas Steve would go to the games he could go to when he wasn't working. But man, when my kids became teenagers, Steve was significantly better. (laughs) He just, he could talk to the teens and relate to the teens and hang out with their friends And I would struggle sometimes. I would struggle with the moodiness. I would struggle with the attitude. I I just couldn't quite catch on like Steve, where Steve was just all in. So I don't think it has to be 50-50. And I think that's an unrealistic expectation. But I do believe that both parents should be involved in raising children And that is not an unrealistic expectation. I just don't think it has to be 50-50. And I think that we have to uh, try to figure out who's better at what and divide and conquer that way, not worry about how much you've done, how much I'm doing. Just let's both do what we're really good at doing and divide and conquer that way. Okay, so what are some unrealistic expectations that we sometimes fall into? Does your spouse need to be your best friend? I say yes and no. I am super happy that Steve and I get along so well and that I can talk to Steve about anything. I have a lot of female great friends, and that has been super important to me. I heard Dr. James Dobson talk about women needing women way back when I was a very young mom, and he basically was saying, look, you should not expect your husband to fulfill all your emotional needs. That's just not something that a lot of husbands do really well. Some husbands are more stoic and not super emotional, and they just have a hard time getting to where you need them to be emotionally. So what do you do in that situation? Well, you seek the friendship of other women that you can get together with on a regular basis that you can talk to, have coffee with, have lunch with, go walking with, have a Bible study with. That's one of my favorite ways. I've always, always loved having women's Bible studies. I think that's such an important way to make friends Mm -hmm. and grow your friendships. Our, uh, as a couple, Steve and I were part of an in-home Bible study for 17 years. That was absolutely monumental as we were raising our children There were couples that were older, just slightly older than us. Some were, you know, up to eight or 10 years older than us, but some were just a few years older than us. And they were such godly Christian examples. They taught us so much. They they were so forthright in their experience raising children and the, the downfalls and the pitfalls and the things that they did wrong and some of the things that they did really right. And they were encouraging and we were reading the Bible together and praying together and we were laughing together and we were crying together. And it was just a way that we 
stayed close together, not just Steve and I, but also with other couples from our church. And that was super helpful to us. But it wasn't just those couples in the in-home Bible study. It was also the women that I met with for coffee, that I met with for walks, that I did um, women's Bible studies with and mom's Bible studies with, that I taught Sunday school with and served with on different committees at church. You know, just that 10 minutes before we got started or 10 minutes after the meeting when we hung out and talked and shared what was going on in our kids' lives or with our husbands or things that we were troubled about or what have you, talking to another woman meant that I didn't have to come home and lay it all on Steve. I could I could get it out and I could talk to them and be assured that they were going to pray about it. And then I I could come home and I felt good and I wasn't, you know, just unloading on Steve and expecting him to carry the full emotional weight of all that I was carrying. So for me, my female friends have been a huge part of my life and even have made my marriage, I think, fuller because I don't expect Steve to fulfill everything that I need in terms of my emotional needs and even just listening because I can get together with other women and go walking, I I have people who listen to me. And then Steve and I can just hang out and I can listen to him and I can add a little bit, but I don't have to tell him the 8 million thoughts that went through my mind today. <laughs> and so that's been very helpful for my marriage. Second thing, a lot of women are looking for a savior. They want someone to rescue them. And this goes back to the Disney idea or the Hallmark movies. Not all Hallmark movies. A lot of the Hallmark movies are like the woman is, you know, a career oriented woman and the man is like a rancher and she doesn't need a man in her life and he's going to come and he's got the family, but his wife died and what have you. But a lot of the Disney princesses needed rescuing and a savior. And we sometimes get that in our head too, that if we get married, you know, then we're going to have a stable income and then he can take care of us and he'll fix all our problems and life will be so much easier. It's not really like that because men are not God. There are a ton of problems that you run into when you're married that your husband will not be able to fix. And to go to him expecting him to fix it isn't going to be helpful. It's not going to help you to feel better. And it's certainly going to put a whole lot of pressure on him. Our husbands are not God. We can go to our husband with our problems and with the things that we're concerned about with our children and that type of thing. And the best thing to do then is to really pray together and go to the person, the one who can change those things and who can fix those things. We can't put that on our husbands because they're just not God. They can fix what they can fix, but they're fairly limited. And as you know, and as I know, a lot of times, in fact, men are geared to want to fix things. And so when we go talk to our husband and we're all rattled and, you know, wound up about something, sometimes we just have to stop and say, I'm not asking you to fix this. I just need you to listen right now because this is something that you can't fix. This is something that God needs to fix, but I just need you to listen. So our husbands are not our savior. They also are not everything. So sometimes our expectations are that our husband is going to be this phenomenal man at work and do this great job there. And then he's going to come home and be the super parent and he's going to coach the team. And he's also going to be on, you know, some committees at church. And he's also going to fix the leaky sink and the car. And he, you know, is going to plan a trip for us on our anniversary and he's going to do all the stuff, right? Um, 
that's unfair. Have you ever felt the weight of trying to do it all? Because I talk to a lot of women who do. I just was talking to a woman last night who was saying, Amber, I'm really struggling. I went back to work this year after my youngest went to school and I just can't do it all. And I said, I don't, I don't think you're supposed to be able to. I think it's up to all of us to find that sweet spot in what we can handle. Maybe you can handle working 12 hours a week and not 40. Maybe you can, you know, do the work, the housework and take care of the kids, but you can't work at all outside of the home. Maybe what you really need to do is figure out how you can live on less. Or maybe you do want to work full time and and maybe that's how your family is going to run, but you need help with, with the housework. Or you need to figure out how that's going to work if both of you are working full time. So it's unfair for us to put all our expectations on our husband to be our everything and to do all these roles and to do them really well and not be tired and not to be stressed out. We struggle with that. Why would we think that they would be able to do that? So instead of falling into this idea of unmet expectations, because we know that unmet expectations leads to discontent. A better thing to do is to communicate together with the expectations we do have for each other. And I did that with Steve before we ever got married. There were three things that I said were really, really important to me. Uh, One was going to church every week. One was I didn't want to talk about divorce. And the third one was raising our children to know the Lord. Didn't know exactly what that was going to look like. And it certainly changes at different seasons. But that was super important to me. And as you navigate through the different seasons of marriage and as things change, because it's a whole different world when you have toddlers than when you have school children and they're in the sports and doing all that than it is when you have high schoolers and even kids going to college and coming back and the young adults and getting married and all that, that it, we're all constantly changing. Our roles change, what our children need from us changes. And it's just so important to sit down and communicate together and to really let each other off the hook with the things that we are not good at. So for instance, I'm going to give you something I am not a great cook. I like to say I can mostly sustain life. I'm not a great cook. If Steve wants phenomenal cooking, he's going to have to go to a restaurant because I'm just not that person. I can make your basic food. I can mostly make the soups, the salads, the sandwiches, the things that, you know, aren't too difficult, but by and large, (laughs) that's just not me. So if, if Steve is a foodie and he wants really, really good food, then we're going to have to talk about how that's going to happen because I'm not probably going to be able to meet that expectation for Steve. Things like the house cleaning, the house chores, let's sit down and have a meeting. I can't do all of this. What can you do? What can I do? You want help with the yard work? You want me to help with the leaves in the fall? And you want me to help with the spring cleanup? And you want me to help when there's, you know, a tree down and you want to cut it up or whatever? Is that something you want me to help with or you don't need help with? Okay, so you'll take care of that and I'll take care of this. Or no, we're just going to hire somebody to do that because neither one of us are very good at that or strong enough, or we don't have the tools and equipment to do it or whatever. Good conversations about expectations. What we mostly tend to do is we have these unmet expectations and we tend to be very discontented. We start to grumble. We take it out on our spouse and we maybe even become bitter instead of sitting down and saying, Hey, so this isn't working. I don't seem to do this very well, or I don't have the time to do this. So how do you want this to get done? Or Steve, you know what I need from you? I need you to tell me I look nice once in a while. 
because I don't always feel secure about my looks. So do you think you could do that? I mean, if we're just open and honest with our spouse about what we really need from them, it's, there's a good chance that if they're Christians and if they want a healthy marriage, they're going to want to meet the expectations. To assume that our spouse knows what we want and need from them is not a good idea. Too often, we realize that we do not do a good job at reading minds. So that's when we fall into this disgruntled attitude and things aren't working well. So I want you to just stop and think throughout this coming week and the next couple of days, maybe take a notebook out and write down what you really would like from your spouse, especially if you're unhappy in some way. And talk to them about it and see how you can fill this. So again, if this is if your spouse is not a good communicator, put it on the schedule. Okay, I know that you don't like to do this. So once a week, I'm meeting a girlfriend and we're going to have coffee or because I, I need this or, you know, whatever it is. Don't live in a marriage that's just so-so. I hope throughout this series to get you excited about your marriage and to equip you to go further. If you're unhappy, if there are things that aren't working out, let's get to the root. What can we do about it? And let's pray and ask God to help us because I know for certain it's God's will when we're married to another Christian, it's God's will for him to bless our marriage and to help our marriage succeed. Will every marriage succeed? No. If abuse is part of the equation, if there's an addiction that's out of control, there are times that you have to step away. But for the vast majority of us, God is for our marriage and wants to bless our marriage. So let's get our marriages as strong as we possibly can so that together we with our spouse can serve God in his kingdom the best that we possibly can. This has been Little Things because in God's kingdom the little things are the big things.